Well, you join me today driving a rather interesting little car. It's a 1982 Mark II Honda Civic. And this one's got the Honda Matic in it. Proud to be sponsored by Diamond Bright, the car care products that have been keeping the furious fleet looking their best for a long time already. To find all you need to keep your car clean and protected, follow the link below to diamondbright.co.uk. This little nugget of loveliness that I'm stood next to right now is a 1982 Honda Civic Mark II 1.3. Honda-matic. Yes, that is a thing. Now, the Mark I Civic was a massive step for Honda. It was their first Europeanized small car designed for the European and American export market. The Mark II came along in 1979 and it grew in every way, became a bigger, more grown-up car, as these things always do. In fact, in a very short time, it had become such a grown-up car that by the time Ford were benchmarking vehicles for the new Mark III Escort, this and the Golf were the two that they were comparing things to. So, from no cars at all in 1962, to the first small car in 1972, to being the biggest thing that's scaring Ford in 1982, that's some fast progress. There were plenty of body styles to go around on this particular car. There was a three-door hatch, which we have here. There was a five-door hatch. There was a four-door saloon. And there was a five-door estate, even. Everything apart from the estate now sat on an 88.6-inch wheelbase, or 2.25 meters, which is about the same size as an early Land Rover, and a bit of a jump up in size from the previous Mark I. Now, even though the car was only on the market for less than five years, from 79 to 84, there were a couple of facelifts in its lifetime. In 1980, it got a very minor facelift, and in early 1982, it got a bigger facelift, which got bigger front bumpers, new lights, and new grills. Or a new grill, didn't get two of them, that'd be silly. Now, even though the Civic was designed to appeal to the British, European, American markets, it does still have a distinctly Japanese, well, otherworldly look to it. Certainly in the mid 70s, late 70s, early 80s, this kind of angular styling, these different lights, they're just the proportions of things. They're just a little bit different to the kind of cars we were used to. It's not ugly, it's not bad, it's just different. And uh, yeah, it took a little while for people to get used to it, but eventually they did, and they bought them in their, well, fairly big drove in the end, especially in America, where reliability is prized above all else. Now, there were three engine options in your Honda Civic in the Mark II generation of the car. There was the entry-level 1.2 or an 1187cc, making I think about 55 horsepower. Then there was a big daddy of them all, the 67 horsepower 1498cc 1500. And there here we have, in the middle, the Goldilocks motor, if you like. This is the 1.3 1300, technically 1335cc, which knocks out 66 horsepower which isn't a lot, but then this car is absolutely tiny and weighs, well, virtually nothing. Now, all the Civic's got Honda's new CVCC, or Compound Vortex Controlled Combustion Engines, which is a lean burn engine, basically. So, pre-catalytic converter, this was a solution that got past emissions and made the car run much more cleanly and efficiently. And look, reverse hinge bonnet, so it's sort of like a BMW. If you want to get in the boot, there are two things you can do. You can put the key in and turn it, which releases things, and you can pull the handle there. Or you can just go and pull the tag by the driver's seat. It's a Honda after all. Now we do have a reasonably okay-ish sized boot for the size and class of car. This um, parcel shelf is interesting in that the top front bit folds back, or the back bit depending on where you're standing, folds back to give you access into the boot. But if you want to fold it more than that, the little tags to slide back and then you can fold back the entire parcel shelf. Or you can lift the entire thing out completely and take it away someplace else and do other things with it. And this car has got a 50-50 split rear folding seat, because don't forget, folding seats were still quite a big deal in the late 70s. If I poke under the boot carpet, we will find a nice spare wheel and a toolkit. And to get to the jack, it's hidden. The jack is concealed in this little panel here, in the slam panel. Pull down two little tags in the plastic trim. The trim comes away, and your jack is hidden in there. Genius, genius. I'm particularly impressed by the small disc of hardboard, which is your floor, to stop things falling into the dish of the wheel. That's comprehensive. Oh look, we've got a uh, courtesy light in the back there as well. Oh wow, it's suddenly turned horrible out there. I've got rainy glasses, very distracting. But wow, inside the Civic though, it's not raining. Inside the Civic, it is lovely. There are two places where Honda just trounced your position um, in the 70s and 80s. One was in reliability, because as we all know, Japanese cars of the period were 
flawless. Well, pretty good anyway. Certainly a lot better than the Fords, Vauxhalls, Austins, Morrises, anything else you care to name. Fiat's, Renault's, Peugeot's. I can name a few more if you want, but I won't. But also in terms of equipment that you got, because these things were absolutely loaded. You may have noticed there are twin fog lights on the back, not just one. We've got a rear screen wiper. Uh, I've got metallic paint. This car has got lots and lots of really good things on it. And inside, there's plenty to look at and play with as well. And not only that, it's all really well thought out. So when I climbed in, I wasn't squeezing my foot to get past the A-post. I had lots of room to, to get my feet in, which is a good thing. I've got lots of headroom as I climbed in. It's actually a little bit lower now in the car. It feels a little bit tight on the corner of my bonds. Uh, but we've got lots of toys in the car. Let's have a look around. First of all, starting on the door, it's all vinyl covered, this two-tone blue. So it actually kind of matches quite cleverly the dark blue of the dashboard with the top bar of the door. And the lighter blue of the main panel kind of matches the carpet and the door surround. So we've actually kind of continued the color theme and the striping of the interior of the car, which is a nice bit of uh, joined up thinking. I think that kind of level of attention to detail gives you a good idea as to the rest of the quality of the car, really, and the way everything else works. We've got mechanical remote mirrors on both doors, not just on one, not just a, <laughs> a nodule on the driver's one, nothing on the passenger one to reach over for, which is the crazy thing that so often happened. We have uh, kid fit windows, no electrics in here, unfortunately. And we've got a little kind of ring pull door handle. It is cast metal rather than any kind of molded plastic. And look at this locking mechanism. Slidey forward, slidey backward, with a big orange arrow to say lock and then the door is locked. Interestingly, you can't open the door from the inside when that is locked, which is like a security feature of modern cars or a safety feature that you can open the car from the inside even when the car is locked. Not here. And we have a little armrest, just a bit your elbow on there and a door pull molded into it, all sort of semi soft touch plastic. Now we have the dashboard, which as I say is in this kind of darker blue color matching this door card. And they've gone for a little bit of poshness here because we've got an insert of wood, uh, or vinyl for my curry laminate across the front strip, very roverish. And that's echoed here on the right hand side in the little air vent just above the coin tray because because coin tray, which is above one of the four air vents. There are lots of air vents. Cars in the 70s didn't always have great ventilation. This is an 80s car, even though it was launched in 79. But we've got very, very good ventilation, I say, with four movable air vents here, two air vents, one in each corner, and a great big strip air vent blowing across the top of the windscreen. So you're always going to be fully ventilated. Now, you may be thinking, what's happened there? He was talking about the wood. He was talking about the air vents. And there's something in the middle of that shelf which he didn't mention. Yeah, look at that tea shelf. That's impressive. Where's my cup? I had to fetch the cup. There's no cup holder, so I can only use the tea shelf when stationary. And that is a serious bit of tea shelf kit in such a small car. You can put a lot of edibles and drinkables up in this area here. There's even flat bits on the corner for extra dips. This is perfect tea shelfery in the early 80s as well. Wow, those engineers at Honda did think of everything. Then now let's get back to the instrumentation and electronics and buttons and dials. We have got a big clear display in front of the driver. Two matching dial areas. The one on the right is your speedometer, which reads up to 100 miles an hour. And it goes without saying, this car doesn't do 100 miles an hour. And on the left hand side, the matching dial area is actually two needle dials, one on the left for temperature, one on the right for fuel, with a warning light in the center for OD. OD? Overdrive, yes. It's an overdrive gearbox. Hmm. In the center of all that, we've got six big warning lights for the all important stuff, oil, handbrake, battery charge, choke, because it's a manual choke on this car, uh, boot open and parking brake. Those are your warnings. There are also additional warnings in the top area of this for left and right indicator, main beam lights and hazard lights. But this is kind of the extent of your warning, which is fairly comprehensive in a compact car from 1982. And in case you've forgotten where the car came from, Nippon Seikai Japan and a serial number in the bottom of the speedo. So you know this is a Japanese speedometer. Now the steering column. On top we've got this little Japanese favorite sliding tiny peg for a hazard light switch, which is kind of okay to see. It's a bit like cut out theater because you can see that from the front, but from the side, it's almost invisible. It doesn't light up, but your two left and right turn signals do light up on the dashboard to tell you you've, you've clicked it. Now on the left hand side, it's not indicators, it's wipers. Off, intermediate, low and high, and then pull for wash. 
because it's a Japanese car of the 80s, the indicators are here on the right, which shares its switch with the headlight turning dial on the end of this big drum of a, a stalk. Indicators left and right just there. Don't get that confused or you'll be wiping to tell people where you're going. But where's the rear screen wiper control I hear you ask? I think that's what you asked. It's down here by my knee. Uh, we've got rear fog lights push button switch, rear wiper push button switch, and a blue push button switch for the rear washer. Blue for water, I guess. And a rear screen heater button as well, because it's got rear screen heater. This car, as I say, is pretty well specced for an 82 compact. A little fuse panel underneath there. And the only other things down by my right knee are a mysterious black button, which I don't think does anything, and bonnet pull, and boot release. Over in the centre of the car, we've got a few things with our manual choke, as I mentioned, because this is not an auto choke and it's going to be carburetor fed. Then we've got heating and ventilation sliders, four sliders in a nice little pattern for temperature, uh, recirculator, or fresh air, and direction, and fan speed. All the basics are covered there. Underneath that, big old ashtray, 12 volt socket and a radio. This has now got a modern Sony, which I'm gonna pop out, I think, because it's flashing very, very bright, uh, colorful stuff at me, which is a little bit distracting. And that's gonna rattle in the glove box now instead. So that will distract me instead. In the center, down by the gear shift, we've got headlamp level adjustment, because I know I said that was an okay boot, but you're gonna have to try quite hard to put enough stuff in that boot to put the back end of the car down enough to need that, but it's got it nonetheless. Then we have the automatic, or as Honda call it, the Hondamatic. This is a two-speed automatic. Two speeds! Can you believe that? So you go from park to reverse, oops, to neutral. Then you've got overdrive and star and low. Star is basically drive. That's one speed of drive. And then when you hit the point where you want to change up a gear, you slide it to overdrive. Yes, yes, that's the that's thing. Then we've got a mechanical, ordinary, proper old-fashioned handbrake, which is good, and then the back seats. The back seats look nice and comfortable, but they look quite tight on my knees, so I don't think I'll bother climbing in there today. And it's gonna rain again, so I'm gonna take this car out on the road. Oops. So this is something new for me. So I've never driven a Honda Matic before. So it'll be interesting to see what this is like. So back to the star and off we go. So I'm waiting for the change but it isn't going to come. So it's giving it a little bit of choke because it's uh, A little cold after being uh, sat doing the walk around. Oh my word, look at that traffic. I've got to get back through that in a minute. Intermittent wipers. Gets the movers up to overdrive. The green light comes on the dashboard. We're in overdrive. This car is currently for sale at Stone Cold Classics at Rutum in Kent. Check out the website because they've got an awful lot of very fun stuff in there at the moment. Well, it's interesting that someone chose this two-speed auto. I guess it was chosen ultimately out of, a, out of convenience over anything else because the base model came with a four-speed manual, but everything apart from the base came with a five-speed manual gearbox with full synchro mesh on it, which in the early 80s was Again, another big deal item. It was a kind of exciting and technologically advanced thing that, you know, the Escort still need a four speed in them. I'm pretty sure the uh, equivalent Astro would have only had a four speed as well. I tell you what, this car is just astonishingly smooth. It's so nice. Oh, okay, drop down to below 30 miles now, so I move back to star and the lower gear. A little bit of possibly engine braking or oh, green light. I'm going for the rear wiper. Rear wiper activated. Rear wiper deactivated. Yeah, that works well. I 
should say this is a very low mileage car. It's only got 31,000 miles on it. So it was always gonna be pretty good. But this does feel like a brand new car, it really does. There's like nowhere on any of the controls. Everything just feels like I'm driving a new vehicle. I'm pretty sure my brother's first car was a Mark II Civic. And I remember driving that every now and then when my car was off the road, being a Rover, it was sometimes off the road. And it was just always flawless. It would just started on the button regardless of the temperature outside, regardless of the weather, and it just drove so well every time. There was never a problem with that car. I only paid 30 quid for it as well. So the 66 horsepower and a two-speed auto, this is not the briskest car in the world. Not the most brisket car either, for that matter. Whatever that means. Um, but it is just astonishingly smooth and it's very comfortable to be in. I put the lights on now because uh, it's getting a bit dark out all of a sudden. So I don't think you can see that kind of nice gluey green glow from the dashboard. It's got a nice heater as well. The heater's on about halfway. I'm getting a lovely little toasty toastiness coming off it. Right hand indicator, of course. It's weird with this thing because it's automatic, so you kind of forget about doing the gears, but then very quickly you realize you've got to do the gears. So that's quite, quite a strange experience. It's, I'm going to say it's unique, but it's pretty not. Someone will definitely call me out on that, but I've never driven a manual shifting auto two speed like that before. It's very, very unusual. But the rest of the controls are very normal and very, very light. I mean, the car weighs virtually nothing. It's not quite K-car dimensions, but it is very, very small indeed. And it certainly feels like you can thread it through pretty much any gap you care to name without any difficulty at all. Steering, lighter than anything and so sharp and direct. We talk about steering having play or feeling connected and there's like no play in this tool. You, you move the wheel a fraction of a degree and something happens at the front of the car. It's uh, amazing how connected that is. The ride's a little bit bouncy because it's uh, quite a short car with uh, fairly soft springing and it rolls a little into corners. It's going to be a fairly short drive today because that traffic that we drove past as I was leaving the garage, uh, I've got to go drive back through that and it's getting close to closing time. So uh, yeah, that's going to be fun. A pretty decent turning circle on this as well. interesting driving this car having driven sort of later Hondas, Rovers and even well more importantly the Triumph Acclaim which was based on the Ballard which ultimately this kind of morphed into or gave rise to certainly. So seeing where it all came from and actually seeing it's kind of how similar this is to drive to the, uh, the, the Acclaim. Now, the Acclaim with, was a bit more powerful and had a slightly nicer ride. It was a softer but more controlled. This has got a little bit of jitter over the bumps and, and thumps, which uh, and looking at the speedometer, there are actually a couple of indicators. Uh, there's an L mark at 35 miles an hour, and there's a star mark at 65 miles an hour, which I guess is the absolute maximum that you can take those gear ratios into. I'm actually in, doing 45 in star at the moment. I'm gonna move up to overdrive now. Yeah, the engine revs fall away. hits at 4550 and the car's just a little bit bouncy now. Doesn't feel out of control or anything, but, but bouncy nonetheless. Often I talk about the smell of a car. And it's funny, this doesn't really smell of anything. I was trying to think if it had an odor I could talk to you about and describe, but there's a slightly sweet smell in here, but I don't know if that's just like cleaning materials that have been used. It's interesting, you put it into start, it's almost like engine braking working as you slow down. Apart 
apart from a little rattle from my seat belt, this car just feels so perfectly put together. It doesn't rattle, it doesn't creak. It's got pop out side rear windows that my camera is hanging on one on, and that's not rattling. That, none of them are rattling at all, in fact. The fit and finish is just perfect on this car. You could pay an awful lot more for an awful lot less in terms of build quality. The engine's a little sewing machine, it just buzzes away quietly. It's, okay, not powerful in any way, shape, or form but it does what it's meant to do and it does it happily without complaining. <clears throat> I was trying to think of um, TV and film references for this car. I couldn't really think of any. I mean, there's high tower, high power in, um, it was high tower, wasn't it? In Police Academy. But I think he had a Gen 1 Civic rather than a Gen 2, which was even smaller than this. I mean, that was, I guess that's where the comedy gold lay in because he was such a big guy and that was such a small car. Although the range ran from 1979, it didn't actually get introduced in Britain until 1980. And then it was uh, replaced by the Mark III in 1984. So when I said it was a five year almost production run, in reality, it's closer to a th three and a half year production run. So not a lot of time in production, but they did churn out an awful lot of these cars. That said, finding, I was gonna say a good one, but finding any today is, more luck than anything else because I can't remember the last time I saw one of these for sale on the road even on Instagram so one of these turning up is a bit of an unusual sight. The only thing with having an automatic like this is that it kind of gives you a bit of engine braking but it also gives you got a constant drive all the time so when you do come to try and brake you are fighting the engine when you hit the brake so it always feels like you've got to push a little bit harder than you thought you might need to to make the car actually stop. That said I do like this car a lot. I love the easy driving of it. I'm, I prefer it with a manual because that's still incredibly easy to use that lovely five-speed gearbox. I even like the kind of idiosyncratic Japanese looks of this era when it, they were sort of aping but going their own way with the uh, European American styling. I particularly like the, um, the way the bonnet's formed. It makes it look like it's got some kind of power bulge happening, which uh, is definitely misplaced considering it's got a 66 horsepower 1.2 under there. Well, thank you for joining me today in this absolutely immaculate and perfect little Honda. This is so much fun. I'll be honest, if this was a manual five-speed, I would probably be uh, looking at the bank balance to see if I could add this to the collection, because this is just so much fun. It's like a Nissan Micra, but just a bit more interesting. If you've liked this, please hit like and subscribe. Smash those buttons like they say on YouTube and the social medias. Uh, join me again next time when I'm driving something completely different.